without any uh, without any carbon, then they would tune the kiln to fire uh, in an oxidated state, which means there's no carbon. Uh, it can be done. It's very difficult. Uh, chances are these were fired in an electric kiln. That way, there's no carbon induction into the environment, into the uh, into the uh, atmosphere, and they can maintain those those pure clays, the whites, and then the colors are allowed to come out, are allowed to pop, and uh, uh, absolutely exquisite work, absolutely in far left field compared to what I do. Um, so I don't know too much about. Uh, um, the meticulous nature of the work, but in terms of, of them as artists balancing these elements, the clay, the glaze, the firing, here, it's, it's all about the color. It's all about the, the surface. It's all about bringing that to the forefront and letting it accentuate the canvas like that they're building upon. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and that goes for the Get out the way, room. dude. And now we'll make a quick stop in this room uh, behind us. Again, I wouldn't, I won't stay long in here because it's so far outside of the realm of what I do. Um, uh, I just, I can't even wrap my head around the skill and patience that is required to take clay and make it look like something that is not clay. It is, it is an absolute mind job to think that this is play. And they, and, and uh, the show has developed enough skill to build it and make it look like everything but play. And, uh, and most of the pieces in here are the same, are of that same character and uh, um, requires a lot of control. But again, as I come in here, I'm applying my, the same elements. I'm looking, at the, I'm looking at the material. I'm seeing, could this be done in any other material? Could this be glazed with any other glaze? What kind of firing is he using, to, or are they using, to try to produce these effects? And, and, uh, and definitely, what, what, what kind of environment, kill environment, would you say? Any wild gas? Electric. Electric, absolutely. Electric kiln. You put this in a gas kiln, you're going to lose all that detail. You're, you're going to lose all that color, all the vibrance. This piece, uh, this piece on the wall, same thing. Anytime you see color as vibrant as that, it cannot be fired in a reduced atmosphere. It cannot have carbon from a flame in the atmosphere. It'll muddle all those colors and it'll start making them mute. Uh, it, will do a, it will do a beautiful job of blending them together, but if your goal is to create this vibrant, this vibrant clash of color, uh, you have to start looking at an electric kiln. And, uh, and that's exactly what you'll see with these works. So um, that, that will cover the glazes. Uh, uh, for the sake of time, we're going to move right into firings. And there's a few firing, there's, there's only a few firing types. We've covered the oxidation, uh, which comes from an electric kiln or a gas kiln without any carbon in the atmosphere. Uh, the next we have or is, or is a gas firing that offers that carbon. Which most, which most artists will use when they're using a gas kiln, because that is why you want a flame. Uh, it's so that you can induce the carbon into the environment to give the effects that we're going to see behind us when we uh, look at Peter Volkis' uh, face here. In, in, this, in this type of firing environment, uh, he's he's using he's using wood to fuel his piece. He's using the, the wood to fuel his kiln, and so with that you have no you have very little control over the amount of carbon that's going into the kiln. 
all you can do is try to is try to open up the doors of the kiln to allow more oxygen in to finish the combustion. But what they what they want to do, where where an artist using an electric kiln is wanting to bring colors out, they're wanting to allow the flame to color the piece, and so they begin to uh, add carbon into the environment, that carbon will carry through and begin to, to bring tint to the side of the piece. When you evaluate something like this, you, have, you would want to begin to look at all the little cues that, that, uh, that the kiln is giving us, um, one of which are waddings. You see these three little wad marks? There's wads on the back side um, because people will use wads to support their pots in the kiln so that it doesn't stick to other pots uh, because this whole surface right here, this whole piece is un was unglazed going in the kiln. Everything you see here is done from the ash that's being carried through the kiln. And as the ash attacks the surface of the pot, it'll begin to melt and create its own blaze. And so these are the cues that you want to look for to try to determine what the artist was doing with this piece in the kiln. And if you come and see the backside of it at any point, there's nothing going on back here. It is just a white pot. And, and it was confusing me as I was looking at it because I knew that it had to sit on something. You know, the ash here is going up the side of the pot. It's going up, but ash runs down, right? You know, gravity will take it down. So how can ash go up and then have a white side on the back of the pot without any wads? And then that's when I remembered that uh, these anagama kilns that they fire in, many times they would fire them on beds of sand they wouldn't put anything under it, and that's how you get these, this very soft uh, backside. It's because no heat is able to reach around the bottom of it, and chances are, not only did it sit, not only did it sit more than likely on a bed of sand, but it was also tilted downwards because you can start to see how this ash was running up the pot. You see, so that means this surface here had to be upside down in order for that ash to attack it and come down the side. So, uh, beautiful, beautiful piece. Uh, Volcus has always been my, uh, my initial inspiration in pottery, and so uh, my work is kind of a push forward from here in, uh, in allowing play to, to do its own, uh, its own thing. I don't have any, any work here, but uh, I do have a website if anybody wants to view it, uh, they can uh, certainly check that out later. The next, the, so this was, this was, this piece, he had to use, he had to use stoneware clay body. He had to use a stoneware, heavily grogged, and, uh, and that's to support the massive amount of weight that this piece has. When he builds these things, uh, he's hammering them together with, with mallets, and with uh, two by fours, he's ripping the clay apart. And so in order to get this piece to stay, he has to use a very strong, sturdy clay body. And whenever he fires it, he's wanting that flame to hit all of these crevices, all of these little knuckles. And, uh, and so he's not worried about the glaze, he's letting the kiln do the glaze. Another, another piece uh, I said we'd come back to right here, this is Don Wright's, uh, a couple more of Don Wright's pieces. Um, same, same thing. He is firing raw clay in a salt kiln and letting that glaze. He's not putting glaze on it. He's not trying to color it. He wants that clay body to be seen. He wants it to be on the surface. And, uh, but for the sake of the finish, for the sake of that, that patina, He's fired it in a salt kiln, and he's let the salt attack the surface. Um, salt is, uh, uh, all my work is salt glazed, 
and uh, and I love the way salt just binds everything together. It brings the colors together. It kind of ties unglazed surfaces with the glazed surfaces. And uh, Don Wright is uh, one of the masters of salt glazed pottery. He's he really has the ability to draw that out. Um, I think there's only. One, there's only one other firing method that I want to point out, and it's back in this room. And then, how are we on time? No one knows? Good? <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so, we're going to look at these three pieces here. Because the Natchlers, the Natchlers, uh, Gertrude and Otto Natchler, um, the most interesting thing to note is not it's not about the form. Um, these are just you know standard standard molds. Most most artists can make them. They certainly have maintained their own little flair and uh, and maintained that that style that they want to keep in their work, but. This, the most interesting thing about this is that they fired these pieces in an electric kiln. They fired them in an electric kiln. And yet, they're getting a surface that looks like it's been fired in a reduction kiln. We've seen a few differences between what, what work would look like in, a, in a, uh, an electric kiln versus in a gas kiln or a wood kiln, and here, these pieces, they're electric fire, and yet they have this amount of reduction that you can't get out of an electric kiln. And and, uh, and for me and my, my friends who all do art together, it boggles us every time we see these pieces, how they look like there's just carbon, uh, uh, saturating the surface, muddling the colors. Um, this one here especially, uh, it looks like it's a piece that's been fired multiple times because the first is a, it's like a lava glaze. You can see that texture, that texture in the glaze as those bubbles burst open. And then they solidify. But then when you closer inspect it, there's glaze that is actually flowing into those crevices. And, uh, and so there are a number of artists that will fire multiple times to get a, the effect that they want. But rarely do you ever see work that has okay, so much more richness uh, and Thank you. almost like a crystallization that you get yeah. from slow cooling in a kiln that's been reduced. And, uh, and, and to this day, no one knows how they did it. Um, I think Mel was telling me that the family still has their kiln, and uh, so maybe one of these days I'll try to buy it from them and uh, <coughs> try to replicate replicate what they were doing. So uh, I think that what what we'll do now is we're going to evaluate one more piece um, using these using these three criteria that that I use whenever I come to evaluate work and. Uh, and then afterward, maybe uh, if y'all have questions, we can go through some questions. Or if y'all have a particular piece that I have not gone over, then maybe we can look at that. So we're going to look right back here. One last time in this room. Mr. Ken, uh, Ken Ferguson. So here is an artist that is dealing with the, the same three elements. He's using clay body, he's using the glaze, and he's using a firing firing technique to try to create an expression. And, and, and this piece is probably the one that's growing on me the fastest because he's using this very, we already know that, or at least I know that he's using a firing method that's very vigorous, so he has to use a stoneware clay body, but he's going into this surface and he's gesturing this figure of the hair. In order to do that, you can't use a very groggy body. You 
can use a clay body that has impurities. Um, it has to have this uh, elastic property to be able to make it and then to go back into, to move through the clay to draw this much um, energy from it. But then when you notice on the outside, the, the greatest amount of energy is on this outside rim where the clay is just coming out at you and the inside is a little more subtle. So to draw your eye on the inside, he's using glazes. He's using this, this, uh, this textured chino uh, that will begin to crackle and craze off of itself. And, and that is drawing energy to the center of the piece. And then to look at the firing method, you'll notice he has these two, there's these two spots on the inside. And Dude, so that what are you is doing? where the wad marks are going to be, indicating that this that this platter was fired in a either a ash an ash kiln like a wood kiln with ash or a salt kiln, um, more than likely a wood kiln, uh, since I don't see any any salt residue. Um, but it was fired either upside down or it was fired with another pot inside of it for these two water marks to be here. There might have been a third one here, uh, but there's no, the, the, the remnants of the wad isn't there. So he might have balanced it just right. Um, but all of this was so that as the flame came through the piece, it would wrap within, inside the bowl and, be, and the flame would be pinched in between the two pieces. And you can see that the flame was traveling this way. Oh, that dude because the discoloration of the glaze goes towards the head of the hair. So you can see this path here and here as the flame came this way and hit this wad and then compressed and then released around the backside of it. And so, so as you look at it, you all of a sudden find comfort in this triangle movement here mimicking the triangle movement of these gestural marks on the outside. And I, I think the piece in its totality uh, is, is, is using all three of those aspects. You know, the firing process was just as important as the glaze. The glaze was as just as important as the clay. And, uh, and every time I see a piece, that's what I'm doing. What is the artist trying to highlight? Is this glaze a special glaze? Is the firing process, is the artist drawing attention to the firing process? Um, they're all so very important. So that's that's what I do as an artist when I, when I walk into these uh, shows, when I evaluate work, um, I'm weighing these different elements because whenever I do my own work and I bring these things home, I'm trying to figure out uh, uh, how I can apply them into my own, into my own work. So that's all. Uh, if y'all have uh, questions, uh, I can't say I have an answer, uh, but if you have any other body of work or another piece that you want me to uh, maybe reference, I certainly can try. So. Thank you.